kingdom law for kingdom living. This is the voice of God for us this year. And this will be explained the whole year. This pin will be produced and distributed to everybody. We're going to remind ourselves wherever we go every single day that we are to live according to the laws of God. We are living under those laws everywhere we go so that we can experience the life that he promised if we obey his laws. And so we want to focus on that subject this year. I want to introduce this, which we did last week, uh, a little of it, during watch night. How many of you enjoyed watch night service? Wow. What a blessing. I don't know whether people just go after watch night. But you couldn't find a seat in this building. They were standing along the side. Where they are today, only God knows. Please write this down. Get a clean sheet of paper. Matter of fact, you probably want to buy a new book. 2010. We want to focus on the priority of law principles for kingdom living. The priority of law. The priority of principles in kingdom living. This will only be introduction, so we will basically give you a grasp of where we are going. And then we'll have communion together and be dismissed. I want to begin by taking you back a little bit, because God is always progressive on a journey. I call it our kingdom journey. We started teaching on the kingdom way back in 1984. Almost 30 years. And the past six years, we've been focusing intently on the kingdom being exposed to the outside world of this ministry. Millions of people have been impacted. I want to take you first, in, 19, in 2004 rather, when I began to concentrate on this message in earnest, we talked about the theme, rediscovering the kingdom. Many of you remember that. We wanted to reintroduce the whole concept of the kingdom to the community. Then in 2005, we focused on applying the kingdom, which has to do with righteousness. And in 2006, we focused on the kingdom culture of influence. How the kingdom influences our environment, our lives, our community. And then in 2007, we focused on the priority of the kingdom, where we got our concept of kingdom first. We focused on God's priority, which was stated by Jesus Christ. Seek ye first. God's priority. Then in 2008, we focused on kingdom culture. Trying to understand that the kingdom is not a religion. It's a country with a culture and the people of that kingdom should live in a certain way that has a culture that impacts their environment. We are not here to wait for a rapture. We are here to occupy until he comes. We are here to make a difference. And then in 2009, we focus on building a kingdom community, which is what culture is about. I am quite certain we did not cover that subject because I still have untaught scores of sessions I haven't touched. But I think we got the idea that God wants to build a community of people who represent his culture and experience his life. And one of the things that we talked about in that introduction series was that a culture is a product of law. And so it was very logical. 
What is the key to building a kingdom community on earth? That is what we must focus on 2010. How does it work? And I could not believe how right on God was. I am so excited. I feel like a banana that's been on the branch too long and the skin is bursted. Matter of fact, if you poke me with a pen, I'll explode on you. I have so much revelation of this year, what we must teach. I can't wait to get through this year. First of all, I want to ask you, what is this decade like? 2010 is the end of a decade and the beginning of another. I hope you realize that. It's not just the end of a year, but it is also the end of a decade. So you have crossed over into a new decade of years. Every 10 years is a decade. And you have made it to this new one. What is a description of this 2010? How would you describe this? God showed me this clearly. He says, 2010 is the decade of worry. Hey, boy, say worry. This is very important. I listened to the news yesterday, as most of you probably listened to the news this week, and the whole world is worrying. When you go to the airport, you got to build up your nerve. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Just to go to it, you got to build up your nerve. You got to get your psychological balance before you even go to it. And now they want you to be there three hours of your life just to sit and be filled up. Everybody, hey three hours. That means a person like me who travels at least three times a week, 15 hours of my life will be in an airport. Multiply by four, that's almost 50 hours. Multiply that by 12, most of my life would be in an airport. Worry. We are afraid. They're going to search you off purse now oh yes they said your handbag will be searched so make sure whatever you carry in you don't mind being exposed because they're not trusting anybody they also are going to search your underwear oh yes worry hmm because the recent terrorist threat showed that the bomb was in the guy's underwear. So they got to find a way to get to your underwear. Hmm. So make sure they're always clean. No holes. They are developing a new machine now that will x-ray you at the airport. People are afraid. Taking a trip from here to Fort Lauderdale is now traumatizing. The Bible says the world in these days will be filled with fear, worry. Decade of worry. Everybody say worry. I'm telling you. Secondly, it's a decade of worry because people are losing their livelihood. Some of you in this room have felt the impact of the economic downturn. You've lost jobs, can't find another job, struggling with how to pay your bills, how to keep your house, how to maintain your car, how to even put gasoline to come to church. Worry from self Sustenance. How do I sustain myself? How do I pay for my children's school? How do I buy food? People are worrying about food. Uniforms for children for school or even for your own life. Having clothing to wear. It's, 
It's a decade of worry. And they already predict that this will last the next seven years. It will take that long for it to come back. That's what they predict. Everybody say they. It's important to remember that they said that. Okay? But we got to ac- accept what they say first. And then we can let the Lord give his report. But first we got to deal with their report. So we live in the midst of that world where people are full of worry and fear. They are so depressed. It's a decade of worry. And then there are those who got problems because they cannot keep their business going. Having to lay people off, having to cut back, having to restrain investment. Having to stop projects. It's a, it's a decade of worry. The governments don't know what to do. Understandably, because they are humans. And this world is baffling humans. We don't know what to do. My friends, therefore, everybody is waking up scared. Whether you go to the airport or go to the work or go to the job that ain't there no more. It's a decade of fear and worry. Well, let's read what Jesus said about this because we are kingdom people. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 20, chapter 6 rather, verse 25. Matthew 6 verse 25. Powerful stuff here. Jesus Christ is describing 2010. Verse 25. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not what? Worry. Do not worry. It's a decade of worry. At least seven years from now, there'll still be economic stress. So, he says, look, do not worry about what? About your life. That's exactly what we're doing. Do not worry about your life. And then he defines what we call life. What you shall what? Eat. That's life for us. What you shall? Drink. That's life for us. What you shall? Wear. Your body. What you shall wear. And then he says, is not life more important than these things? I don't know. Because that's why we go to work. We go to work to get a paycheck to buy those three things. He said, no, life is more important than that. In other words, he took our priorities and made them no priority. Which means he must know something that we don't know. Not only that, he knows that those things are needed. Which means that he knows you need those things. Did I just repeat myself? Yeah, for a purpose. See, in other words, he's not saying you don't need those things. You know you need those things. But he says, I don't want you to live for those things. Which means that life got to be more important than those things. What's he talking about? He says, what is what is life? He says, And then he throws his point in. He says, is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothing? He's trying to strip us of this worry thing. Then he says, look at the birds. I'm getting ready to go home now. I finished, you know, right there. Listen, here's a woman who cannot pay her rent cannot buy food for her children, cannot keep the light on, cannot keep the telephone on, cannot keep the water running, cannot keep the tuition paid, and Christ says, go look, go go outside, go look at birds. Now, wait a minute. Is he daft, stupid, ignorant, insensitive? Don't understand what we're going through? It's something he knows. Ladies and gentlemen, this makes no sense unless... You understand his thinking. Do you know that I live by the law of birds? Stress free. He just listed all your problems. And then he says, look at 
the birds. He just told you all your stress. And then he says, now go outside and find a tobacco dove. Go on the beach, study the seagull. Is he insensitive? Is he playing games? Oh, I'm so excited. He said, look, no matter what you do, you can still need food and clothes and water to drink. You can still need shelter for your body, a roof over your head. You can still need this stuff. So they, they're there. He says, whether you can get them or not, you still need them. He said, but if you worry about them, you still won't get them. Worry is the number one most useless activity on earth. I'm talking to someone here today. Worry only changes one thing. Your blood pressure. And it goes in the wrong direction. So he says, uh, go look at the birds. Read the next part. Look at the birds of the air. Of what? The air. You got to take every word Jesus said. Even the word air is important here. Where are the birds? In the air. <laughs> he says birds are where? In the air. Why? The air was made for birds. Birds ain't houses. <laughs> They're not in caves. They are where? They are where they are supposed to be. That's important. Birds of the air. Then he tells you what they don't do. Let's read. They do not so. Why? Because they ain't supposed to. <laughs> they do not store up. They ain't supposed to. And yet, see, if you stop doing what you ain't supposed to be doing, God will do some things he's supposed to do. And one of the things you ain't supposed to do is worry. You know why God ain't doing nothing? Your worry is in the way. Apparently, worry blocks supply. Let me put it another way. Jesus said, because the bird is not doing these things, this is why God is providing for the bird. He's saying, look, work is not what makes you wealthy. According to him, it's not work. They don't sow, they don't reap, and yet they own all the trees. They can land anywhere, eat anything, anytime. Birds are wealthy. He says, but there's some things they don't do. Two thousand and ten, find out what you ain't supposed to do. Not just what you do, what you're supposed to do now, what you don't supposed to do. Because what you are not supposed to do will block what he wants to supply. And the first thing he says you're not supposed to do. I want you to leave all your worries in this room. We can put them all in the front foot of Jesus Christ. He can collect them up. He says, cast all your cares upon me. Why? Let me care for you. Oh, I like the way you say that. Let me, now, you know, the care got to be handled, but you ain't got to care for the care. Let me care for you. Let me worry for you. Look at the birds. The heavenly father does what? Feeds them. He feeds them. Then he says, let me show you how futile 
worrying in 2010 is. He says, who of you by worrying could add what? An hour to his life. He said, no matter what you do, you still get 24. So when you use them for depression, frustration, complaining, gossiping, crying, saying what you ain't got, time still using, time is going. He said, you better find what to do with your time so you don't use your time in the wrong way because time is still there. As long as you complain, you're still using time. Worrying doesn't add to your life. It takes away. Then he says something even more astonishing. He says, and why do you worry about clothes? Of course, Jesus Christ was not in the Bahamas when he said that. (laughs) Because, you know, we have an anointing for clothing. But he says, why do you worry about what? Clothes. He doesn't want you to be naked. We know that. He wants you to have good clothes because you represent his kingdom. But he says that should not be a point of worry. Then he says this. He says, look at the flowers. What's wrong with this man? First, he said, go look outside at the birds. Now he tell me, go look in the garden at the flowers. How does that help me? And then he rubs it in. He says, look at them. The lilies of what? The field. Now remember, the birds of the air. The lilies are what? Of the field. Write the word field down. Write the word air down. It's important. These are important words. Because these are the key to law. The birds are in the air. The plant is in the soil. That's why they are succeeding, he says. You'll get me before you go. He said, look, the key to living in an atmosphere of worry is to do what the plants do and what the birds do. And all of a sudden, worry goes away. They've been announcing an economic crisis for the past four years. Somehow, the mango tree down the road ain't got the message yet. It is still bearing mangoes. They keep announcing it. It's getting worse. It can be losing their job. And the mango tree says, what are they talking about? Shoot, 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 shoot. Shooting out plants. I mean, listen, let's go talk to them. Find out what, how come y'all ain't feeling the crisis? Are you with me? The birds are flying over you while you cry. Depressed. They flying and they singing. Aren't you mad in the morning when you hear that bird outside your window, your lights off, and he's singing. Shut up. How can he be singing when I can't find lunch for my children? That's why God sent me here today. He sent me to show you the secret to the birds. Christ says, go look at the birds. Go study the trees. They are doing something that you need to learn. They don't toil. They don't spin. They don't plant. They don't reap. They don't collect in bonds. They don't save up. They they don't get stressed out. And yet... Your heavenly father. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Dresses them better than you. Look at the last part. Everybody say now. Say lilies of the field. That's important. The field is important here. Because if it's lilies of the tile. Let me say it another way. You miss me. If you plant lilies on a tiled floor. The lily's clothing dry up. The feel is important to the lily. (laughs) You can take the best mango tree you have and plant it on your tiled porch. 
and you will destroy every potential of that tree. Because the field is important to the tree. Listen to me. This has to be the most astonishing year of your life. If you follow God's instructions, God is going to mesmerize you. You hear me? He is going to blow your mind every week. You're going to say, how did that happen? And God's going to simply say, because you were rightly positioned. That's all. Look at the last part of this verse. He says, I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was dressed like one of these plants. If this is how God clothes the grass. I think we better stop there. Hey? Because we think that grass just growing. But Jesus, now either Jesus is telling a lie or he's telling the truth. He says, God clothes them. <laughs> Thank God I finally got real plants. Okay, these plants are real. Look at how beautiful that is, man. And the Bible says, God painted them red colors in there. They didn't just show up. That's a handiwork of God. Glory. Hallelujah. He said, look at that. God dressed that. God dressed the plant, he says. He went to the point where he dressed that. He don't want his plants to be naked. Then here comes the big question. Read the next statement. Are you not much more valuable? than these they are here today gone tomorrow in other words when God even gives you temporary things it's first class <laughs> you all missed the place to just shout amen because look the grass has lasts for 24 hours and I dress them I know they ain't going to be long but they always look nice even when I dress you for a short time, you look like you can be there forever. You look clean. He said, when I, when I take care of you, they're going to remember how you looked. They are here today, gone tomorrow. And I take care of them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And his last statement is a question. O ye of little faith. Do you have faith? Do you have faith? How many have faith? Hold your hand up real high. You believe you got faith? You got faith? Okay. Well, according to Jesus, it is tested by your level of worry. Whether you have faith or not is determined by your level of worry. If you worry, then you got no faith, he says. What is worry? Worry is, I thought I would, I think I, I define it for you. Know, worry is preoccupation with what you need. It's preoccupation with worry. It's where you occupy yourself worrying over the things you need. He says that is a futile exercise. And now, let's then conclude this. What should be your primary concern? Not food, not clothes, not water. 2010 must no longer be a year of these things because they're going to be scarce to most of the world's population. Poverty has increased by 3% last year. That's a lot of poverty. The American unemployment rate has been the highest in 30 years. That's a lot of people out of jobs. 
The Bahamas hit double digits in unemployment last year. That's the highest we've had for over 15 years. What do you do? He says, go outside and look at the birds. I'm so excited what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> okay. Jesus said, look, if you're going to pray for something, don't pray for food. Don't pray for house. Don't pray for water. Don't pray for clothing. Why? He said, because those things, they make you worry, man. He said, if you're going to pray, prayer is petition. That's why we're going to use this whole month. Just to get before the one who puts clothes on flowers. He said, look, if you're going to pray, prayer means petition. It is a legal activity between you and a government. The word prayer actually means petition. Petition is only presented to governments, to authorities, people in power, in government. He says, when you come before the country of heaven, the government of heaven, and you come to bring your petition... Here's what the petition, Matthew 6. It says, therefore, when you pray, this is how you should pray. He said, I'm not want you to guessing it. Here's how to do it. You pray like this. Our Father who is not on earth. Why is that important? Because earth ain't working. If your source has a problem, you got two problems. <laughs> You got a problem, and you got a problem with the source problem too. But if your source is not on earth, there's hope for earth. Can I hear an amen? amen. Jesus never placed the Father on earth. He always makes sure he's not on earth. Because he knows earth got scarcity and lack. Earth got problems. He says, wherever any two of you shall touch and agree concerning anything on earth... It shall be done by your father who is in. He keeps putting him in heaven. Why? Because that's supposed to be your source of supply. Our father who is in heaven, holy is your name. That means fear him. Do you know what the Lord spoke to me this year? He said, 2010, I can put the fear back in my church. People are not scared of God anymore. We need to be scared. Yes, I use that word, scared. The stuff you're doing, oh man, you have no fear of God. Is he holy to you? We do things so easily. We break his laws so easily. And then we ask him, forgive me. No fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. God doesn't begin with wisdom. He begins with fear first. When you become afraid to disobey God, you start obeying him. When you obey him, you keep his laws. When you keep his laws, then wisdom kicks in. So don't pray for wisdom. Pray for fear. Ask God to make you afraid again of breaking his laws. Holy is your name. And then he says, now pray this. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. In other words, he's telling us God wants to bring not, not just your bread and water to earth. He wants to bring an entire country. Oh, man. You praying for food, God. Don't pray for food, man. Pray for the whole culture where there is no lack. You praying for water? Forget water. Pray for the one who makes wells. I found out something. You ask God for something, and God give it to you, it's going to run out. You got to come back again. It's like, it's like asking God for mangoes and God give you mangoes. And God says, you know something? I give you what you ask for. Why don't you ask for the tree? 
That's what the, the kingdom is the tree. It's, it's the whole thing. You ain't got to come back begging all the time. You got the thing in your own life. It's barren every day. Don't pray for things. Pray for a country to come. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of God is a country and it's a nation. And here's what's important about a nation. All these are built on laws. Everybody say laws. Say it again. All countries are built on laws. And that's what makes a country a country. Everyone agree to the constitution. The constitution is the established agreement between the people and their own government to obey certain laws and live to certain standards. That's what makes a country a country. So when Christ says, pray thy kingdom come, he's saying, pray for an entire culture with a country that has laws to come to earth and stop worrying about food and clothes and, and, and water. This, friends, is the key to 2010. The world is full of worry. He says, you better leave that world, get into another world, and get under some different laws that have free from worry, stress. It's a country. Everybody say laws. The first thing God gave Moses to start a country was law. Ten commandments. He says, tell them to obey these laws and I will bless them. I'll bless them going in and coming out. As a matter of fact, law is what produces and preserves and protects the people. The problem with the Bahamas at the moment is we have lawbreakers. And stop thinking about the guy who just murdered. I'm talking about them folks in them office who teeth him. See, sometimes you just, you just see you know, like, like the, <laughs> the street crime. We got white collar crime, blue collar crime, yellow collar crime, no collar crime. We got crime at all. Crime is violation of laws. We agree that we don't take other people's property. That includes the, the, the pen in the office. That ain't yours. Oh dear. Thou shalt not steal. That's a law. That includes the paper in the man's copier that you're using to copy your private stuff. This, this is Stephen. You're breaking the law. And then you come to God and say, God bless me. God said, wait a minute. You are a thief. I don't steal them. How do you? Yeah, but use thief paper. See, and we separate them like, you know, like they do different sins. I know, you, I know what you're thinking right now. Let me see what I did last week. <laughs> see, okay. That's why I am trying my best to live a holy life. For my own protection and my own preservation. You don't obey God to protect God. You obey God to protect you. God doesn't need protection. You need protection. So he says, keep my law, and my law will guarantee your protection. The law of God is good for you. Not for God. God ain't got no problems, except you. <laughs> and God's problem with you is, you and I are not obeying his laws. That's, what, that's the problem he got with us. He wants to bless us so badly. Oh, don't miss next week, man. Listen, I remember God told people, all of us know this, you know, but we just don't get it. God said, look, if you obey all the laws that I gave you, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. It will give blessing, overcome, overtake, overtake. You missed the first part. If you obey the laws. If you obey the laws, you don't need to look for the blessing. He says what? They will look for you, run you down, and over Lord have mercy in my life. He said, look, this year is supposed to be a blessing overtaking year. But it all depends on what you do. So we got to 
their chaos. Chaos is a result of violation of law. That's all it is. And the greatest challenge of all nations is lawlessness, including the nation called the church. Lawlessness in the church. <laughs> when you stop at a red light and no one's anywhere around, that's rare. Don't look now at anyone. Here you are at a corner way out west, down where nobody is. There's a red light and ain't nobody there. And the red light comes up. You stop. You look. Nobody coming. Temptation. Why would you stay at that corner and no one's watching? Only one reason. You fear the law. You respect the law. Lawlessness destroys a country. Lawlessness. When you take a man and put him in prison, you take away his what? Privileges. The benefits of being a citizen. His blessings. You lock him up. For 20 years, and he has to wear one set of shoes, one set of pants, one t-shirt, and eat the same meal for 20 years. No privilege. He can't go anywhere he feels like. Can't do what he feels like. Can't get up when he feels like. Can't go to bed when he feels like. His whole life, all the blessings have been taken away. Only because of one thing. What did he do? He broke the law. You think God's any different? So let me prepare you for next week. You see this plant? Let's go look at the birds, okay? When you leave here today, I want you to go on the beach and study the seagulls, the gullies. You go find some birds because here's the secret to success. Yes, Lord. Everybody turn to Matthew 5. Last scripture, Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the first day of the ministry of Jesus. I call this the preamble of the constitution of the, uh, of the kingdom of God. Just like the Bahamas got one. Jesus got one. What is a constitution? It is the contract between the government and the people. Christ is about to initiate his country called the kingdom of heaven on earth. And he is about to lay what I call the parameters for his country. Here's how the country will be governed, he says. The same way you got yours, I got mine. And the Bahamas, our preamble says what? These islands of the corner of the Bahamas shall be governed according to the Christian principles the Christian faith, and so we kind of create our own boundaries for how we're going to govern. Well, Christ is about to establish his country, and he quotes his preamble. His first statement concerning how he's going to govern. Glory, hallelujah. He said, here's how I'm going to govern. The Bahamas does it. The United States does it. Canada does it. Everybody decides how we're going to govern. In America, for example, they don't start with the Christian principle. They start with we the people. That's why they govern by what the people say, the majority says. That's why they can change theirs based on what the people say. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. In the Bahamas, we say we're going to govern according to the Christian principles. Some folks try to take that out because that block you. Answer, you want to respond to that? Oh, let me tell you, okay. As long as that's there, you can fire, fire.